Hey, hey, happy Sunday, everybody. Thanks for joining me on another stream. Uh, this is Alan, aka Gorilla with a Brush, and uh, it's nice to see all you guys. Oh, uh oh, sorry. I've got my, I had my stream up when my computer started getting the, the delay echo. <clears throat> so, nice to see you. I see Mr. Heath's out there uh, looking for someone else in chat desperately to talk to. Um, I don't know if we have anybody else on stream, but I, I appreciate you. If you're out there lurking, thanks for coming. Mr. Heath, always appreciated that you're here uh, supporting me. I, it means a lot to me. Um, so a little bit of an exciting morning. Um, I was able to, and at first this is going to seem like I, you know, I wasn't supposed to do this, but I finished Allie this morning. I finished her base. And I know that I was working on her 100% on stream. So here's what her base looks like. A little bit of a couple spots that are still wet, some stuff drying. But that's her base, the rest of her. What I actually did was I recorded finishing her off. So I used the same setup I usually use for my Twitch, but instead of uh, streaming it, I just, um, I just recorded it. And the reason I did that is because I really wanted to work on the Atlantis Miniatures Dwarves during today's stream. So I wanted to save that. And um, got some other things coming up. So I just wanted to finish Alley, but I didn't want to record it for you guys. So there's a couple options, and you guys can let me know what you would prefer. So I can just take the video and just upload it as a video that you can watch anytime you want. Um, put it on my YouTube channel, put it on the Twitch videos. Um, you can watch it at your leisure. I could also save it for a day where I'm not able to stream and also not able to even be there for chat or anything like that. And so it can just be a like a makeup video for a day that I can't stream. Or we can set it up as kind of a special stream where I'll play the video and I can do it where I'll log in and I can chat with everybody if they have questions about what I'm doing. So I'll be in the chat, but the video won't be live. So you know you won't be able to ask me questions that I could verbally respond to, but I could respond to in the chat. So. You can let me know how you would like to um, have that video available to you. Um, you can just mention it in the chat here. Or you can always message me on any of my social media if you're watching this back. So, um, but yeah, so she's all done, which is really exciting. And um, hey, uh, Haleyish, I appreciate you don't you don't have to say anything else. Thanks for saying hi um, and, and lurking. Um, that is fine. I'm gonna set her off to the side so I don't mess her up. So yeah, for the big, for the rest of the Atlantis miniatures, we've got, I've got five more that I'm still working on finishing. Um, I'll show this one. This one doesn't have any progress on her so far. So this is the Troll Slayer model. She's a really, really cool, Model. She's got, you know, the crazy braids like all of the female models uh, in their range do. She's also got a bear pelt that she's wearing that kind of comes up around her head. Um, she's got the normal little accoutrements like, you know, rope and other things on her. And a couple severed troll heads just for good, good, for, me good for good measure down there on her big uh, two-handed axe. So she's going to be fun. I'm going to paint her up last of all the dwarfs. Um, I did a, I took pictures, I'm going to do a written tutorial for the scribe that I finished a couple weeks ago. And um, I'm also going to do a written tutorial for her from start to finish. So I don't have any paint on her yet. Um, I don't have too much on her. So this is one of the villager models. And so I've done all of her skin. Although you know how it always goes. You do all of this nice layering and then you realize you missed a spot. So she's got toes peeking out from underneath her. Uh, her clothing and I didn't do those so I'll have to go back and do those later um, but then the three male warrior models are what I'm working on right now so we got this guy who um, did one of the tartan patterns on him so I'm not too far along with him but he's got his beard and his skin and his shield we're all done um, and then these two guys are kind of a, a nice contrast because you've got one with a nice warm color this guy's got lots of a golden tone to his skin tone and his um, his beard and hair. 
So we're going to keep things a little bit more like greenish brown, goldish brown on him. And then this guy is a much more cool color palette. So blues and even the grays have a little bit of a blue or purple undertone to them. His skin tone, um, you know, has he's got like the side shave on his head, which brings a little bit of that blue, uh, cool tones into his skin. So I'm just going to be working on these guys today, these three male warriors. Um, feel free to ask any questions. I'll try to explain as much as I can about what's going on um, as I do it. I'm going to switch over. I have my iPad here, but I didn't have the Twitch chat up. I was trying to do it all on my laptop, but I've got the double video going from my actual recording and then the, um, the stream. So that is uh, screwing me up at the moment. At the moment. Hey, Dark Soul, Odin Dark Soul, how's it going? Um, tired of all of this snow, Mr. Heath says. Got 24 plus inches and he's been digging out. How are we all doing? So, we have not been battling snow here in Arizona. Uh, quite the opposite. We had unseasonably warm temperatures this last week. Uh, it got back down the last few days. It hasn't been too bad, but it, we, we did hit 100 on Tuesday or Wednesday, I think. Um, and that's never fun to hit 100 in like the second week of April. Um, so that's that's kind of a, been our week. Uh, in terms of how else I'm doing, well, I kind of tweaked my shoulder this last week, which means that I haven't been able to, rock, I didn't get to rock climb today. Unfortunately, that's usually my Sunday morning thing. But um, my right shoulder hurts when I lift it about more than that. Really, really sore. So taking it easy. Um, try not to overdo it. It's just a hobby. No need to push, push too hard. So I'm thinking about what the next stage I want to do. Let's. It's not going to be very fun, but or very interesting. You guys, I'm going to work on this guy's pants. They're kind of the. The deepest recess part of him I need to work on before I can do stuff. Hey, Dreadroll, what's up? So he's again, he's a much more um, cool tone. So I want to keep that going with him. I don't want to just want to keep things more cool tone with him. Give him some gray pants. Wow, you're in Italy. You spent eight months in Phoenix a few years ago. So we are um, on the east side of Phoenix. So we're in a, one of the suburbs, um, Gilbert, Arizona. Um, we actually live right on the border of between Gilbert and Queen Creek. So if you just go, I don't know, like a couple blocks from here, you're actually in Queen Creek, Arizona. Um, so it's pretty much in the south east corner of Maricopa County, which is the county that Phoenix is based, Phoenix and its suburbs basically fills the entire county. Um, so we're down in the southeast corner. I'm trying to think of landmarks you might, you might know about. Um, so the Mesa Gateway Airport um, is out here nearby. Uh, ASU East Valley campus, the Polytechnic campus is close by. Um, the GM Proving Grounds. Um, yeah, we're out, in, you know, near the Superstition Mountains, out that side of the valley. Go a little further south. You're in Goodyear. You're on the basically the exact opposite corner of Maricopa County. My brother's a pilot. He was. He worked as a flight instructor for a long time, and he worked out of Goodyear Airport. So yeah, I know, I know where you're at. That's opposite corner of the valley. So 
what I do. I'm using um, graphene gray as the base coat for, for his pants. I base coated this guy in the same brown that I base coated the other two models for in terms of all the areas where he's got pants and leather and stuff. But I might end up doing a lot more black on him just to sort of keep the color scheme going. I might have a lot of black leather on him. Uh, he he trained for Lufthansa. Um, I'm not sure what the actual name of the place was, but it was the Lufthansa pilots um, that he was mainly training. some miskatonic gray this is another cool cool gray that is a small world man that's crazy what did I freehand on this mini um, so the stripes that are on his blue, th so the glaze color I used on this is one of the scale, the fantasy and games colors, which has a satin finish as opposed to the matte finish. So right now it's a little shiny, which makes it a little bit hard to see some of the details. It'll knock down with dull coat when I'm finished, but, um, the stripes on his clothing are freehanded. And then, I mean, some of the shield design, although I... I made the shield pretty worn, but the paint's all chipping off. You can see the wood from underneath. You know me too well, Mr. Heath. There's always got to be, always got to be some free hand somewhere.
So I don't know if, for those of you watching, if you're following me on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, but you might have noticed, you might have seen the note, the uh, announcement that the dwarves, um, the dwarves didn't make it to Atlantis headquarters on time. Um, I sent them basically with guaranteed shipping to get there a week ahead of time to give us a little bit of leeway. And they sat, they've been sitting for 10 days in customs. And so, so much for the, the uh, guaranteed delivery date, but as, but as the best we could do, get them over there in time for salute. But unfortunately they, they didn't quite make it. Not for this convention anyway, well, they'll, they'll be there for all the, the future ones, but I was really excited to, for them to see the models in person. Um, just have to wait a little bit longer. Hey, Landcores, welcome. I appreciate you stopping by, man. Whenever I watch Landcores' videos, I'm always very jealous of his amazing accent. I wish I had a nice, you know, sultry, maybe sultry is not the right word, but a nice, uh, you know, smooth accent. Just got this stupid American accent. I think I joked on his stream one time about, you know, come for the mini painting, stay for the accent. Were you, Landcores, were you at the, the salute? Um, convention or what were you doing in London? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't know if any other uh, shipping method would have been any different. Um, the fact is they're stuck in customs, and I would guess that no matter what method you use to ship them, they go through the same customs. Um, I could be wrong about that. I honestly, I don't really know how international shipping works for different carriers. All I know is that I that, that don't trust the United States Postal Service when they give you a guaranteed delivery date for uh, overseas. Yeah, I I was so excited for them to get it and see it in person. Did did they have at least I he's got one of my models. I don't know if he had it there with him or not. Um an old orc war chief I painted. Um from one of their other their previous releases. So I don't know if they had him on hand at the the convention, but yeah, man. I was so bummed when it didn't make it on time. On Monday the 9th, when it was supposed to get delivered, I woke up and you know, I was hitting like refresh on the 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 shipping update, just like waiting for it to say that it was moving or out for delivery or nope, it's just sat with the uh, stuck in customs update basically since the 6th. It's really unfortunate because, you know, I'm sure any of you guys out there who are painters know this already, but, 
you know, stuff looks so much better in person. You know, one of the one of the tricky things is when you look at a model like this, and if your computer screen is anything like the one I'm looking at right now, you know, you're probably looking at it at three or four times the actual size of the model. And so, you know, when you see it in person, it's just a totally different experience of, of how it actually looks and what the details look like on it. Um, so I'm, I'm excited for them to finally see them in person. I'm bummed that they didn't make it to salute. Hopefully Atlanta still had a really successful weekend. Um, I really like that company a lot. I know I talk about them a lot, but I really like their miniatures and I, I like Dan, the owner. I really hope nothing but the great success for these guys. All right, so now that, that I've kind of built up a few layers of color, I've built up some texture on the pants. Um, you know, I like to, to tell the normal joke of, now we're gonna paint over everything we just did. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna go back with the graphene gray, that base color I used. And hopefully nobody plays a drinking game with my stream where, you know, the word glaze is the key word where you have to, to drink every time I say it because that would, you might not make it through the stream. But we're going to mix up a thin glaze of graphene gray. And I'm just going to go over that spot a few times over the pants. Again, this isn't a wash. So I'm, I'm not putting tons of paint on my brush. I'm just trying to tone the colors underneath, bring the layers together. I'll do a little bit of shading at the end of this, but I'm going to get some of the flat black color. So again, I think I'm going to do black leather for this guy. So I'll start base coating that area in between putting on layers of of the glaze. You have to play my drinking game now. Yeah, I'll show you a couple things that I'll be working on. So one of the things that I'll be painting for sure pretty soon is um, the Celtic busts that I helped to produce. Um, so here they are. It's a really, really nice, uh, sculpted by Stavros. 
I'm not quite sure how to pronounce his last name, but, um, but yeah, really, really nice detail on these models. Um, they're really great. And then they've got their little extra bits like axes and swords and stuff and braids coming from their hair. So by the way, if you're watching and you like these, you want to order them, you can go to my website, grillwithabrush.com. You know, a little plug for myself. You can also message me on social media and I can, um, we can connect that way. But I definitely am going to paint these guys soon. So that'll be one of my projects. Um, if you guys do order one of those, it'd be kind of fun. We can do like a paint along and so you can use the tips that I'm giving you and actually try on the busts on your own. Um, so that's one project. Another project is my, my next commission after this is a Redemptor Dreadnought for one of the people who often follows this stream. So we're gonna do, he's, it's kind of like a lion theme. It's a custom chapter for Space Marines. So we're gonna do, you know, like a, a strong lion theme. There's gonna be all sorts of filigree and really cool freehand designs all over the Dreadnought. Um, so that'll be my next um, commission project after this. I have a couple little small commissions that are kind of one of those like, hey, fit them in whenever I can over the next couple months. Um, one of them is the limited edition Privateer Press model. Um, I think an Ashlyn model just went in their, their version of the loot crate. So I think she's got like fire wings and then fire blower. So that'll be fun. And then one of the other limited edition Privateer Press models, the Blind Water um, pinup girl. So she's like dressed like an alligator or whatever. That, so those are some, some of the uh, projects coming up. Um, just for fun, I also, I don't know when I'll get to him. But this 75 millimeter scale Wraith, I just got him um, primed today. He's a little hard to see because he's all black right now, but while I was doing uh, priming Allie's base this morning, just went ahead and primed him. So he'll be fun to do at some point. Probably my next 75 millimeter scale model. So Landcores, you were, I think last time, or one of the streams I was watching of yours within the last few weeks, you were painting up some racers for a game. And ever since I saw that stream, I've just been seeing social media flooded with people converting toy cars into paint, um, like painted models. Is there some new game that got released or something that like everybody's building essentially Mad Max style cars for? Um, I kind of, when I was watching your stream, I must admit, I, I thought you were just kind of playing around. It was just a fun challenge that you had done. But since I've seen so many other people doing it, it makes me think that maybe there's a game for it. I feel out of the loop with a lot of that stuff these days for some reason. What do the backs of the busts look like? Is that what you were asking, Mr. Heath? Um, So either that or you were asking about the back of the the wraith.
and my wife and I have been getting really excited for the the new season of Westworld coming out. I don't know if you guys watched that show, but that first season was so good. So we're actually we've been rewatching season one, getting ready for for the return. Really psyched about that. Yeah, that wraith is going to be really cool. I'm, I'm, like my mind is going to a million different places of how to, how to paint him. You know, do you do him really, really dark and rusted and sort of a, like a shadow figure? Do you do him with a lot of glow aspects to him, like he's glowing from the inside out? Um, so I don't know how I'm going to do him yet. I got lots of ideas. I haven't settled on any paint scheme for him yet though. Westworld is, I mean, it's just really, really well done, but it's it's got this, uh, I think it's 10 parts, so it's like a 10-hour season. But it's just got a really nice, long, slow burn storyline with a lot of mystery aspects to it that kind of unfold um, as the series goes on and really get to a nice climax at the end of season one. Super excited to see where season two is going. I've been trying to avoid any trailers or any information at all. I'm the older I've gotten, the more I've the more I don't really want to know much about what I'm going to see ahead of time. I don't really want to see movie trailers or shows. I mean, if I just kind of want to know, like somebody tells me that it's good or. You know, the buzz is that it's that it's worth seeing, and that's all I really want to know about it. Get really... I kind of get tired of if, if I've seen a trailer or something and you see these scenes and either you it sort of gives away too much of the plot or there's some epic scene that you just can't wait to see when it's in the movie and you just find... I find I just spend most of the movie just waiting for that scene to happen, which kind of takes me out of the moment of enjoying what I'm watching. So, yeah, so I just try to avoid all that stuff. So I have no idea what season two is about. But I suspect it'll be pretty epic.
Is Westworld the show that has no guns? No, there there are definitely guns in Westworld. Um, the guns can't shoot or aren't supposed to be able to shoot um, guests. So, I mean, the, the basic premise without doing anything beyond what you find out in the first five minutes of the show. Um, there's essentially a giant amusement park kind of thing that's set in the desert, like an old west town and the surrounding areas. And tourists pay to come visit this location and there's all sorts of built-in adventures they can go on or things they can do you know so do they want to take part in a big train robbery do they want to you know join get deputa deputized by the sheriff and go out and hunt bad guys or, you know whatever their fantasy is it can happen in this world and the the hosts are essentially like androids that seem like real people. And so the people who are there in the park are free to shoot the androids, but the androids can't shoot the people. So you're supposed to be basically immune from harm. you can take part in all sorts of adventures. So that's the premise, but then there's just this amazing you know, unfolding drama story that takes place with the main characters. Really well done. And that's all I'll say about it. heard the new movie Quiet Place or A Quiet Place or something like that. It's supposed to be really, really good. Again, I, I don't know what the movie's about because I've been avoiding trailers, but it's been getting a lot of buzz. My wife and I like thrillers and scary movies, so it's on our list to go check out. I think you might be right, Mr. Heath. I've not seen that show, but Badlands is a, into the Badlands. It's like a, I know it's a, a big martial arts type show. really wanted to see Into the Badlands actually for quite a, a while. One of my problems is that a lot of the shows that I watch happen when I'm painting and martial arts shows are, are kind of tough to watch without really watching much, without watching the screen very often. Because um, most of it's fight action scenes.
going to mix up just a little bit of a glaze of the black. You have to drink if you're playing the drinking game at home. We do some shadowing on the pants. like in the, the black more with him these other areas are going to be metal that are left brown so i'll go black do those later most of these areas are going to be uh, like a black leather color so i need to start doing some texture Favorite fantasy monster and creature? Good question. Um, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to, to beat a dragon, right? I mean, just in terms of just pure power and awesomeness, and it's hard for me to imagine picking something other than a dragon. Um, If I had to have a second, I would probably say like a griffin. Um, very powerful imagery associated with griffins and obviously powerful creatures. So I'd say dragon and then griffin would be mine. Those aren't, I know, too exotic, but um, you don't have to dig too deep into the D&D &D monster manual to find those. Owl bear. Have you ever played the board game Lords of Waterdeep, Mr. Heath? Yeah, yeah, you have. Um, for those of you who haven't, really, really well done board game, worker placement game, but it's set in the D&D &D city of Waterdeep. And the, it's kind of the reverse of most D&D &D type adventures where usually you're the party of heroes you get hired by NPCs to go and do crazy stuff. But in this game, you are the NPC, essentially, that are hiring the heroes to go do things for you. And so you win by having all the heroes go achieve things for you. And so you're drawing these quest cards, and then the worker placement is you're sending agents out to recruit heroes to come back and do the, the tasks for you. And one of the, the best ones is to tame the owl bears. And I always think that one's funny because if you play the game with people who aren't really like D&D &D type people, but they enjoy it because it's a, still a fun game. But they always get to that. They're like, owl bear? What the heck is an owl bear? It's, it's fun to see the look on their face when they...
by the way, what I'm doing here is over the areas that are going to have that have black leather. Um, I'm just putting on this texture. And like with the other stuff that we do, I'm going to eventually go back over it and, and do quite a bit of glazing to restore the, the darker tone and make it look more black. But then the texture will still show through. So right now I'm just doing the texturing. Funny about the Lords of Waterdeep game, my sister-in-law, um, I kept bringing it to game night, and we, we can never convince her to play it because of, you know, the box art and everything has D&D &D all over it. She's just like, right, I'm not interested in that, and finally convinced her to play it. And she immediately went and purchased the app version of the game, the digital version of the game, played it something like three times a day for the next several months. You know, whenever we have game night now, that's the game that she requests. And it's gotten to the point where her husband is like, you know, it's a good game, but can we just take a break from Waterdeep for a while? I think I, I just have to nix it. Like, we just can't keep playing this game all the time. Exactly. It's not a Lords of Waterdeep is not a D&D &D game. It's a D&D &D themed game. The game would work exactly the same if you made it about farms and farming or set it in space or whatever. It's it's a very much pasted on theme. It makes it fun if you're a D&D player and you know the stories of Waterdeep and you know what the stuff they're referring to, but if you don't know any of that stuff, it doesn't detract from the game. I've also found it's kind of funny to, if you're playing with non-D&D type people, is you make them explain what the quest is that they're, that they're completing. So like, you know, I make my mom say things like she's, confronting the Xanathar and things like that. <laughs> By the way, you maybe have noticed as I'm doing this texture stuff, 
I mean, this is basically going to um, serve as the highlighting for these areas, even after we go back and glaze over everything. So I'm focusing on the areas that would get a little bit more light, leaving the shadows. favorite board game man that is that is actually a very good question um, I can list some of my favorites maybe I will eventually settle on a favorite so Lords of Waterdeep is definitely up there um, one of the reasons I like it is, is especially if you don't play with the expansions it's just a you tend to have very close scores at the end of the game so nobody ever really feels like they're totally out of it, which I think is important when you, you know, are playing with varied groups of people. Um, so I really like that game. Uh, Kingsburg is one of our big favorites here in this household. Um, so if you've never played Kingsburg, it's um, it's another one of these games that's pretty well made. So people in terms of balance so people tend to finish the game with fairly close scores unless you have somebody who's really 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 a veteran of the game and knows the exact um, sort of best path to take and then playing with some new players but generally speaking people tend to finish the game with pretty close pretty similar scores so that's another good thing but the way the game works is um, you've got um, you know the king there's a king and all of his court, and then you're basically like a governor who's you know, overseeing some part of the kingdom. And you have a, a board in front of you with all these buildings that you can build, things like watchtowers, um, guards, guard, um, so watchtowers, walls, palisades, um, markets, farms, churches, all sorts of things that you can build, and they all give you different bonuses. And you go through four seasons every year. In the first three seasons, you roll dice, and the dice determine, you kind of like strategically place the dice, and you influence different advisors at courts, and they give you resources for doing that. And then you use those resources to build the buildings, and the buildings earn you points and also give you other bonuses. And every winter, you get invaded by some army. Like, they could be goblins, barbarians, dragons, whatever they are. And... Um, every year there's a range of how strong those are and so you have to be prepared to face those those monsters but you don't actually know quite how strong they are they're just on some scale um, and so you go through five different years and then whoever has the most points at the end of the five years is the winner and so it's got some really unique mechanics that are different from pretty much any other game that i've played um, so we really like that the expansion adds a lot to the game so i, I recommend the expansion it's kind of one of these where it has six modules, and you can play with any any of the six modules, any combination of them. So it gives you a lot of various combinations of ways to change the game up once it's feeling a little stale from uh, repeated play. But that's that's a favorite of ours. Um, lately, we've been really into the Harry Potter deck building game, so that's been a favorite. Um, I'm not sure if you count that as a board game or not, kind of in that realm. 
I would say those prob those are probably our top three at the moment. There's a lot of honorable mentions that I would that I could pick. Um, Power Grid's always good. Uh, Galaxy Trucker is pretty fun. You build like a junk spaceship to tra to transport stuff, and you're once you build the spaceship through, it's like a timed round. Everybody's grabbing pieces and trying to put them together like a puzzle on their board to put together a spaceship, and then. Once time's up, then you all have to fly your ships, and then the ships go through like a gauntlet of attacks by pirates and um, asteroid fields and all sorts of stuff. So that's fun. Another honorable mention I'll shout out. This one's really, really good for like my game nights with my buddies and stuff. I have not taught my wife this game yet. I feel like there's maybe like a 50-50 chance that she'll love it or hate it. So we haven't quite got around to trying it out with her yet, but uh, it's called Merchants and Marauders. So it's basically a, um, like a game set during Pirates of the Caribbean type world. So the board is a giant, um, you know, mostly ocean space, but it's all the islands in the Caribbean. And you draw a random captain and you start with a kind of a lowly ship. And you've got options to either get money and fame from doing merchant trading. So having a merchant strategy and going around and trying to you know, trade a bunch of goods or from being a pirate and going and taking down merchant vessels or even naval vessels from some of the major powers like England and Spain and France. And you can use your money to buy better ships. You can even take over other ships in sea combat by boarding them and, and take, killing all the crew. So if you're able to do that, you can even go take like a man of, a man of war from one of the the powerful nations but it's a really really fun game it's kind of a sandbox game so they really they really open it up and you can play however you want you can try to earn points however you want there's a lot of a lot of different ways to get your glory points and then it's the first person to get to 10 glory points wins so i kind of i like that game just by the sheer sandbox nature of it That's been a big hit when we've played it a couple times. After the first time we played it, the four of us who played in it, we kind of spent the next three or four days just texting about the game. It's like, oh man, what about this strategy? Or what if we had done this? Or So any game that gets you, you, know, you, you keep talking about it for a bunch of time after that, I think it's a pretty solid game. There's a, there's a space version of it that's pretty similar called uh, Chia. I don't know exactly how to pronounce it. It's XIA. That's kind of the equivalent set in space. Um, there's enough differences in the mechanics that I, mean, I think both are worth trying. But, it's, but overall, the idea that they're kind of sandbox games and lots of different ways to win. So if, if you prefer the space sci-fi setting, that one might be the one you want to try. Trail in the House on the Hill. I'm trying to remember if I played that game or not. There was one of the games with House in the name that I played one time. Um, and you asked what was the name of that game. Kingsburg? Is that the one you were, talking, you were asking about? Sorry, I kind of fell behind on chat. So Kingsburg is the one that has the dice. You influence the advisors. You play for five years, and you've got the invading armies and stuff. Um, Really, really, really fun game. Uh, 
um, it's kind of like Lords of Waterdeep in the sense of it's a set time limit. Well, not time limit, but set turn limit. So with Lords of Waterdeep, you play eight rounds, and once eight rounds is done, you're done. So it's not it's not like you're playing to a certain number of points. You're playing to a set game length. Same thing, you're playing for five years for Kingsburg. I think I've played Flux twice. Um, I played the original and then I played the sci-fi version, I think. It's okay. The I think I had a really bad experience the first time we played and it was one of these that it just lasted forever. And then most of the people we were playing with were drunk. And... Um, which considering that a lot of the rules change all the time, there was tons of like, no, wait, that's not how this works anymore. And then they would just be laughing and giggling. And it was just kind of a bad, bad experience that left me not too eager to play Flux again. Just one more step, and then we'll start glazing.
So I'm just going to put a few random little um, black dots. Again, just kind of part of the texture process. Break things up a little bit. Put a few lines like they're scratches or Sometimes it's good to go back where you've done lines or scratches and put a little light dot right at the same spot. Kind of give a sense like it's a little gouge or something like that. What I'm actually going to do for this glaze, I am going to add just um, I'm pretty sure that Innsmouth Blue was what I used on his um, clothing. I'm going to add just a little bit of touch of this to the black just to help tie the two areas together keep these these black areas with a little bit of a cool undertone to them Do I do anything for the bottom of the back foot? I mean, I kind of just, like I just roughed it up a little bit. Um, just give a little bit of hint of like some boot texture or something like that. Nothing too special. It's, it's not all that visible really when he's standing. It's kind of pointed down a little bit. Um, you could always, you know, put some mud or something on there if you really want to. That would look cool. And because this is so dark, it's really almost a, it is a glaze, but we're also almost shading, or not really almost, we are shading at the same time. So it's good to follow the, the normal procedure of when you're shading, move your brush in the direction of your shadows. So I'm still going to try to more or less follow that as I do this. Pull that darker paint down into the recesses.
I didn't do his belt on the last pass. I also realized that I, I was I was planning to do the little he's got like little leather ties in his beard. I missed those two, but I'll have to go back and do those later. Actually I have all the paints mixed now. My organizational structure is failing me, guys. I lost my black paint. By the way, I'll take this opportunity to again give a little shout out and thank you to my friend Gray who came out last week and co-hosted my stream with me. We did a fun Q&A broadcast where we had questions that people had sent in ahead of time that I answered and I answered some on the fly, questions people had. So that was a lot of fun. Have to get Gray on again. Yeah, exactly. I mean the big pile of paint bottles. Um, let's see, can I? No. Anyway, yeah, the big pile of paint bottles um, that accumulate as I'm working on a project. And I have no idea where the black paint went to. It's somewhere in there. Um. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Heath. Yeah, it was fun. Gray's a fun guy to talk to. Big into video games and Magic the Gathering.
Right. Coming along. Missed the back side of the little letter pouch. found it. It was pointing at an angle away from me. Odin Dark Soul, I'm listening to you while painting some of my Sigmar Stormcast Eternals. Nice. Those are some impressive models, the uh, Stormcast line. Lots of fun stuff you can do with those guys. What? What's your... Um, I'm trying to think because I know I've seen them on on Twitter. I'm trying to remember what the color scheme is that you went with on them. I have a couple Stormcast models. I, I could not tell you what all the names of them are. But I have one of them with the sword and a shield. I've got one of them with the big wings. I had planned to paint a couple of those for the, the charity uh, raffle last year, but I didn't get around to it. I only got uh, four models painted for that. This year, hopefully, if I have time, I'm going to do a, a Death Watch Redemptor Dreadnought for the charity.
Yeah, the one with the hammer. Yeah, I don't know what the, the name of that one is either, but um, yeah. There, so Mr. Heath, there are five, just five dwarves left. So these two, uh, this guy, uh, the villager, and the troll slayer. And so she'll be the last one I do because I'm going to do it. Uh, another tutorial for her, and then she'll be the the big send off model. I'm really happy that you're painting along with me. Um, I always like when I watch painting podcasts or painting uh, streams. I like to paint along with them too. I don't know. It's, it's just kind of fun. It's like it's like hanging out and painting with somebody. watched the Andre the Giant documentary that HBO put out this week. It was really interesting. I was never, growing up, when I was a kid during all of that stuff, you know, the match with Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant and stuff, I vaguely remember all of that. I, I didn't really watch wrestling, but my cousin was kind of bigger into all of that stuff. I remember him talking a little bit about it, but we were just kids. That documentary is really fascinating about his life and his medical condition. Filming of the Princess Bride, all of that stuff. Again, not being a wrestling fan, or at least WWE wrestling. I still was riveted. It was. We started it at. We usually go to bed around eleven. We started at ten thirty. It was like an hour and a half long. Like, yeah, oh, we'll just watch the first half hour and then we'll go to bed and then we'll finish it another night. Um, we watched the whole thing and then went to bed really late. <laughs> My, my cat is dreaming right now. He's like making uh, growling noises and stuff.
Do you know, Mr. Heath, on the Discord, like, um, does Discord, when you do something like this, would it be a companion to the stream? So it would be like, um, like we'd have a Discord room and everybody could be talking and then the paint stream would still be going through Twitch or does Discord have its own streaming service that I would, I would stream through? I've never used Discord before. I've heard it thrown around about a bunch, but I don't really know much about it. I used it one time to give feedback to a, a game that I was part of a video game I was doing beta testing for. But it was really, to me, it was like just a chat room in terms of how I was using it. I didn't use any other features. I don't know what else was really enabled or how they were using it. And if it's doable, if it's something we can set up, I'm, I'm game for that. I think that would be fun. It would probably be a lot less, uh, a lot less downtime in terms of quiet times. Probably keep me more entertained. being able to listen to you guys talk so I don't feel the need to have to fill all the, the space. But that would be really neat. Yeah, if you if you check it out and, and let me know just kind of what you find out in terms of the, the basic nature of how somebody could use a, like a audio chat room um, in conjunction with streaming, that'd be awesome. Keep finding spots that I failed to I failed to glaze over.
Sorry, I'm just kind of planning out my next thing I'm going to work on. And I don't know how many people who are out there right now were at the, here at the beginning of the stream, so I'll just show again. Um, so I did finish Alley this morning. So the model I had been doing totally on stream. And I realized that I didn't actually finish her on stream, but I did record the process of finishing up her base. And so all I need to do now is to go and actually spray her with dull coat and just finish off finish that off and I didn't know what you guys wanted in terms of getting access to that video so we have a couple options I could just upload it tonight I can put it on twitch as a video and I can put it on uh, my YouTube channel as just a video so you can watch it whenever you want um, I can save it for a, a day that I won't be able to stream and so I can put it up as a substitute for me not being able to stream on a Sunday um, I wouldn't be able to interact with you on that video, but it would just take the place of the normal stream and you could watch the video then. Or I can make it like one of these nights, like I could um, like set it to stream like Thursday night or something, and then actually sit there and be on chat and um, watch it with you guys and then be able to interact with you on chat if you had any follow-up questions or just, you know, to BS in chat and just, you know, hang out while we all watch uh, the final bits of finishing her off. So if you guys have any feedback and you're you're out there listening, let me know what you would like in terms of having access to that video. Um, in addition, so Ali's done now. If you are interested, uh, she is for sale. So if you're serious about wanting to buy a collector piece from me, um, shoot me a message on Twitter, Facebook, send me an email. Um, all of that contact stuff is up on my screen right now, so um, feel free to... Oh, well, I guess my email is alan at gorillawithabrush.com. Um, pretty easy. You can also send me a message through my website. So if you're interested, you know, contact me. So what is on the base, um, on her base, is it does kind of look like an old camera. It's a gas mask. It's part of a gas mask. Let's see if I can get it on camera to show you. It's kind of tough because she's really tall right now. That's probably a good angle. Um, so these are the two lenses. And then this is one of the, the respirators. And so it looks like you know it's missing the respirator on the right-hand side, but it's like an old gas mask. Yeah, it's probably it's definitely was tough to see from, from that angle. got it sorry I'm I'm kind of purposely stalling at the moment because I have a cat on the prowl and he's about to uh, I think climb over everything and come join us I didn't want to be in the middle of something and... it's too bad Cass isn't on uh, on chat right now it's her it's her best friend Diego 
He's currently uh, nuzzling with the laptop. All right. So I'm going to do non-metallic metal blade on this axe. And unfortunately, I don't know how long I'll stream for. We could, I suppose we could make this an extra long stream. I don't know how long people can actually stay. Or I can at least show you the beginning of this and then just finish it tonight. So I use Bearing Blue from, I use the recipe that Scale um, provides. Scale Color actually has a recipe for non-metallic metal steel. So I use their recipe. Every so often I will adjust it just slightly, but. So it starts with a base coat of Bearing Blue. You can get this recipe and all the colors uh, there's a non-metallic metal steel or non-metallic metal set. What's it called? The non-metallic metal paint set. Looks like this. Comes with eight paints. Um, so you can't do the gold. They have a separate set for their non-metallic metal gold and copper. But this is for their steel and similar colors. If you go to my main Twitch page, I have some links um, to Amazon stuff that you can purchase through those links and I get a little bit of a kickback through that if you use those links. I tried to put any of the Scale 75 paints that are available on Amazon there in terms of the sets. And I can't remember if the non-metallic metal set was available. So I don't know if there's a link for it there, but you can always check that out. Or uh, Scale USA is kind of the authorized distributor of Scale 75 products in the US. You can order through them. I'm kind of partial to, there's a company in Michigan called Michigan Toy Soldier. And I buy a lot of stuff through them, like paint supplies and things. And they, they, uh, they carry Scale 75 paints also. That's where I bought a lot of my, a lot of my sets from. So they have a kind of a cool thing where you can sign up for free to, to be kind of like a member of their website, which gives you 10% off anything that you order. And then they'll have sales every so often that'll be um, a certain percent off. And then you can also get your member discount on top of that. So they have a nice, nice discount. They also have really good customer service. So if your local game store doesn't carry scale products, those are a couple options. Okay, well, I'll keep streaming until, I'll, I'll do another 20 minutes or so and then we'll, um, we'll sign off. But if you gotta go before then, that's fine. Um, so then you're going to take Arctic Blue, and this is going to become where there's where there will be a lighter tone on the the axe, so like where the reflection will be.
Yeah, it's just as you said, Mr. Heath. It's just color painted with different color paints. Um, this is the primer color I use for everything. And now here comes the beginning of a very, very long process. And this is where non-metallic metal takes forever if you want to do it um, with smooth, seamless transitions. So you're going to mix up a glaze. Everybody drink. And the glaze is going to be a mixture of the two paints that I just put down. And essentially, I'm going to glaze the transition between the, the, the two colors. And if you do this enough times, and if your paint is thin enough, you will eventually get a more or less seamless transition from one color to the other. Now there's lots of like little fixing you have to do. Sometimes you have to go back and take the um, like the bearing blue color and start kind of glazing back the other way because you end up with starting to get too light over here. So you got to work on like the transition over here back into the bearing blue color. Um, eventually you'll have to start taking some of that Arctic blue and going back over the, the light part because it's going to start uh, darkening up some. And it's just a matter of just lots and lots of glazing back and forth. Every so often you'll establish, you'll reestablish the highlight point with playing a little bit more arctic blue and then just keep, keep going. Um, once I'm happy with the, the highlight area, the lighter part, then you start adding in Caspian blue and eventually you can put a little abyssal blue into the Caspian blue to start establishing the shadow areas part it's going to be darker um, and then what you can kind of do to to add some extra visual interest is in those darkest spots is you can glaze a little like really dark red like a dark reddish brown or um, like purple or just different color kind of down into the shadows to add a little visual visual interest tie it with the rest tie it together with the rest of the model Just get some cool effects going.
hardest part of doing this is waiting between the layers to let them dry so that you don't like mess up and start like going across wet paint and then creating a texture to it. One of the tricky parts with doing this glazing over and why you kind of have to eventually start to reestablish those highlight areas is if you remember my mantra when you're glazing is that if you're using a lighter color you move towards the light the highlight spots if you're using a darker color you move towards the darker like the shadows. 
So the tricky part with doing this intermediate glazing tone is that it's both darker than the light color and lighter than the dark color. So which direction do you paint? Because if you're dragging from um, the dark color into the light area, you're dragging, um, it's like as if you're highlighting, right? But you're highlighting into a lighter area, like the paint's already lighter that you're going into. Or if you're trying to shade, so you're taking the color from the light area down into the dark area, you're dragging paint into the dark area, but that paint's lighter than the dark paint. So it kind of makes it almost impossible to follow that guide. So what I do, if you kind of see, so I started off by you know, base coating with that mid-tone color, painting on the highlight part, mixing a two of them together. So now I've got like a mid-mid-tone and then starting to glaze, and I was going from the dark, darker paint into the lighter paint. But that starts to just completely you know, remove the, the brightness of that lighter paint. So what I need to do is reestablish that light color paint once I've started to get that transition going. And what, I'm now, what I now have is a, is a zone that's sort of this medium, coat, medium tone. So I can keep working on the transition from the darker color into that light color. And I can even now start going from the light color down into that same area. So now I'm actually doing what I should be doing, which is um, you know, moving paint from lighter area to darker area, darker area to lighter area. And I've got that medium zone where everything's blending towards. One thing you could actually do is you can actually paint three colors in there. So you could bait, um, base coat with that bearing blue color, um, mix up a half and half of the arctic blue and bearing blue, paint you know, towards where you want it to be highlighted, then paint the arctic blue, and then mix, a, mix up a glaze of the mix of the two of them and, and basically um, glaze towards that mid-tone color. So that works too. It's, a, it's effectively what I've done. I just didn't actually paint a solid coat of this color during the first part of that process, if that makes sense. Both methods, basically the same idea. Yeah, it's it's not easy. It definitely takes some practice. Um, I don't know. Would it would it be beneficial to actually demonstrate what I'm talking about, just like in the middle of my color palette here, or is, is it um, the same kind of concept? I mean, this concept makes sense. Or I guess I could um, draw it out on a piece of paper. I don't know. Okay, makes sense. It's also up to you to decide how sort of buttery smooth you want the transition to be. Um, you know, the more smooth transition you want, the more glazing layers you have to do and more you have to go back and forth and make everything perfect. Um, 
you know, smoothness and perfect transitions is not everything about miniature painting, uh, especially if you're doing tabletop. That's, that's really not something you have to worry about. Um, but there's even people who, I mean, in terms of art, there's impressionist painters. There's not people who always go for perfect realism. And even this isn't really perfect realism. Um, and so it's really just about what you're trying to achieve. You know, I'm going to pop this up. I'm not actually going away. But if you go back to my weight screen um, and you look at the blade of the Wolf and Prowler, who's up in the top right corner, um, I used the exact technique I'm showing you here to do that sword, and it's pretty seamless for the transitions. Um, it's very, very nice, but it took a long time to do. And if you're not really going for that kind of smooth transition and you want to just sort of hint at the, the color differences, you know, you don't have to make everything perfectly smooth. Um, just kind of depends on what you're going for. There's a guy, Matt DiPietro. He used to be one of the staff painters for Privateer Press. And he has this style that he calls sketch style painting. And so for him, when he paints in the sketch style, it's, it's when he's not really going for you know, competition level pieces, but he's doing studies. Like he's trying to understand how light would work on a miniature. Um, trying different color schemes and things. And so he really, really, it's like the equivalent of, of an artist who's a, who draws sketching and just kind of getting a general idea about some different shapes. And, you know, you see people sketch books and things. It's kind of the same idea. He sketches on miniatures. So he, you know, everything's very rough, um, but it comes together in a comprehensive look and it really still has highlights and shadows and lots of interesting color, but he doesn't spend a lot of time on each miniature. He just tries to learn something from it in terms of color and, um, composition and things like that and so you know smooth blends is not the end-all be-all of miniature painting although when you pull it off it does look pretty impressive I will say that All right, so I'm going to actually turn off the stream there. I'm going to stop there because I think you can start to see, even now, um, you should be able to, let me zoom in a little bit here. You know, we're starting to get there to a really, really nice, smooth transition towards this lighter area. And so my next step is gonna be, I'm gonna keep working on this transition just a little bit. Then I'm gonna come back in with that base color that I, I started with. And I'm gonna start about right here and I'm gonna start glazing back towards where the darker parts should be. So I gotta re start reestablishing some of that base tone color. And eventually start adding in the shadows and going and, con and continue to go darker, moving away from um, the areas that are the light spots. Um, but hopefully that little demonstration at least gives you the idea about how you create those transitions between two different colors and makes them buttery smooth. It's just a lot of glazing. It's really no other way to do it other than airbrushing can do it um, sort of easier. But there's also like this airbrushed look. You know, you can usually tell when things have been done with an airbrush. That's not to criticize it, but if you're not looking for the airbrushed look, I mean, this is essentially how you do those transitions. So. Um, thanks again, guys, for joining me with the stream. Um, like I said, I will definitely um, get that alley video up. It sounds like um, 
sounds like you guys would think it would be really cool to watch the video with me. So I'll, I'll publish it as a, uh, I think they call them a premiere, something like that. So Twitch can, can sort of pre-schedule them. Um, and so I'll, I'll put an announcement on my Twitter when I've, I've decided when that'll be. Um, so I don't know, we could, we could do it on a Sunday. I mean, just the normal streaming time and I can watch along with you guys. But I'm kind of enjoying doing these Atlantis miniatures. So probably for as long as I still have dwarves on my desk, I'm gonna probably keep doing videos with the dwarves. So maybe I'll do a special um, non-Sunday stream um, with finishing off Ali and I'll post on my Twitter and Facebook when that'll be. So um, yeah, Mr. Heath, Odin Dark Soul, everybody else who showed up, anybody who's out there lurking and just hanging out, I really, really appreciate the support. Um, I'll just do one little uh, kind of request for things that you can do. Um, again, I always offer all my content for free. I don't expect you guys to do anything in terms of sending me money. I don't hide my stuff behind a Patreon wall. So. Um, one, some of the things you can do to support me, like I know uh, Mr. Heath does all the time, just for example, you know, if I put out a, a tweet that says that I'm gonna be streaming live, you can retweet that, that it's really simple. It helps me out, helps me get new followers, helps me get more exposure, um, helps me keep doing this content and, and stuff for you guys. Um, something else that you can do, um, you know, just like my photos, comment on them. Um, it, keeps me going and keeps me motivated. I appreciate that. So the, the simple, easy stuff that you can do. If you do want to support me monetarily, um, again, I sell those busts right now. Those busts are available on my website. You can always purchase those. Um, you can purchase any models that I've painted. You can get a commission from me, any of that kind of stuff. Um, so there's, yeah. Um, but again, I appreciate each and every one of you. Um, it just gives me a lot of motivation to keep going, keep producing uh, models when I know I have people out there who have an audience or is an audience for that stuff and who appreciates it. So um, you guys mean a lot to me and I appreciate you um, stopping by for the stream and watching. So have a great week, everybody. We'll see you in the future.